the, the Glorious Revolution establishes the principle of parliamentary supremacy. Parliamentary supremacy. Which is the idea that Parliament is the supreme authority in the British political system. Today, Parliament is supreme over the constitutional monarchy and is also Britain's highest judicial authority. By the way, when do you think Britain's Supreme Court was established? It was established, believe it or not, around the year 2009. And I happened to go there and visit. When I get back to class, I'll show you photos of, of, this, of their Supreme Court. Before that, where was Britain's, what was, what acted as Britain's Supreme Court? Uh, the Upper House of Parliament. Okay. So, but in the 19th century, Parliament's legislative powers and the Cabinet's executive powers had become fused. And gradually, this developed into the parliamentary system of government that, that we know today, known as the Westminster system. Adult suffrage, right? That means the, the right to vote. The, 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 the gradual expansion of, of suffrage um, began in the late 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century. It was only in the 20th century that the franchise or the right to vote was given to all adult males and females. Okay. So the chapter emphasizes that English and, and then subsequently British nationalism stressed the concept of free individuals under the law, contributing to, to a democratic political culture. Ultimately, what defined the English, English nationalism was the way in which the English governed themselves. And this was defined in part by democratic principles, uh, which gave rise to a civic political culture. This was accompanied by the development of private enterprise and a pro-democracy middle class. So also the rise of political parties dedicated to parliamentary democracy, the conservative Tories and the liberal Whigs. Uh, this started in the first half of the 19th century. Both parties accepted the existing constitutional framework of a limited monarchy um, and a cabinet, account, a cabinet accountability of the parliament and a restricted fran franchise at that point, um, which was limited to men who owned property. Unlike other countries like France or Germany, Russia or Japan at that time, there was no thought of military authoritarianism in Britain. Both parties feared the resentments of the working class. Um, uh, the Poor Law of 1839 actually decreased state expenditures uh, for the poor. The Labour Party is eventually formed, and, and the Labour Party rejects, uh, even though inspired by socialism, rejects Marxist re revolution, and it brings the working class into the, the democratic system. All right, the Labour Party, as we talked about before, were social uh, democrats, meaning that they, they embrace some elements of socialism along with ballot box democracy. They believe that participation and, and economic injustice of the working class could be found within the parliamentary system. Okay. Now, as you know, Britain has a universal health care, which we don't have in the United States. When did this begin? It begins after, um, after the war, and they establish the National uh, Health Service, uh, providing almost free health care for the entire pop pop population as well as national health in insurance. And during this time, Keynesian tax and spend policies were utilized. Right? And what's very interesting about this, um, whether conservatives like Margaret Thatcher or the Labour Party was in power, no one is talking about dismantling uh, the, the National Health Service. There's a general consensus on the, on the, on the welfare state uh, in Britain. Okay. All right. 
what, what are the three largest parties in Britain? You have Labour, uh, the Conservatives, and the, and the Liberal Democrats. British parties tend to be much more centralized than parties in the United States. They play a more direct role in defining policy goals, nominating candidates for office, conducting election campaigns, and coordinating legislative and government activities. Another difference from the U.S. is that they have dues-paying members, and only those members who have paid dues are allowed to vote uh, to, to nominate candidates for their House of Commons. Um, how is the party leader chosen? All parties in the UK have an explicit procedure to choose the party leader. And who is the person most likely to become the Prime Minister, should the party win a majority of seats in the House of Commons? Right? So one thing interesting, any prospective uh, Prime Minister in Britain has to be a, an MP, right? a Member of Parliament. Um, UK Prime Ministers must have polit political experience in national poli politics. No such experience is required um, to be the, the U.S. President, right? As we know, um, well, Donald Trump is, is, is we have an election on Tuesday, and I hope that everyone does vote. Right? November 8th. Okay, few British people take part in the party nomination process than Americans who vote in the primaries. About 100,000 people, um, each in the Conservative and Labour parties, and fewer in other parties. The, uh, when, when are elections called? The Prime Minister may ask the Queen to call elections at any time. And what are these called again? Snap elections or anticipated elections. While the British law requires parliamentary election at least every five years, Prime Ministers uh, they generally call snap, snap elections before the, the end of the Parliament's five years. Um, if public opinion polls look favorable to the government, the, the motivation to, to call snap elections is very high. So snap elections are the rule, uh, more than the exception, in, in Britain. And there's strict limits since the passage of the Corrupt and Illegal Practices Act in 18, 1883 on, public, on spending by individual candidates. Uh, there is no limit on spending by parties. Voters, how do people register? Voters may register by mail. Election authorities may conduct a door-to-door -door search to make sure that all eligible voters are on the registry. And we know that um, what kind of electoral system does, does, the, does the UK use? The same one that, that we use in the United States, right? The single member district plurality method. But generally, voter registration is much easier than it is in the U.S. Turnout is more than 70%. Uh, all right. And we know that with such an electoral system, what does that tend to produce? It tends to produce a two-party system, which, which is essentially what Britain is, right? Between uh, Labour and, and the Conservatives. Right? And who's in power now? Look at the Conservative Party. Okay, so to be, how does a bill become a law? To become a law, bills uh, must be passed by a majority of those present and voting in both the House of Commons and Lords. Unlike the U.S., the Houses do not consider similar bills uh, simultaneously. Because the House of Commons is democratically elected, unlike, unlike the House of Lords, they have the right to hold the government accountable um, and to vote uh, it out of office if a majority of the, co of the commons no longer has confidence uh, in the prime minister and the cabinet. So the legislative process is very much dependent on what we call party discipline, meaning that all members of a party vote in the same way, right? uh, unanimously on most uh, legislation. There's also a shadow cabinet. Whether the conservatives are in power 
or the Labour Party are, are in power, um, uh, the front benches are taken taken up by a shadow cabinet. So each of these people is assigned a portfolio corresponding to a to a formal cabinet post. The leader of the opposition party is the shadow prime minister. There are also backbenchers. Backbenchers. I want to make sure you can see the, the board. Backbenchers uh, behind the front benches. Ordinary MPs who have no position in the government or, or shadow cabinet. In committees, after the first debate is on a bill is taken, the bull, the bill moves on to parliamentary committee for scrutiny. With a voting majority, the government has its bill passed about ninety-seven percent of the time, right? So that's very different from our separation of powers. Private members' bills pass less frequently, and these are bills from individual members of the House of, of, of Commons. They also have the right to propose bills into legislation. As a general rule, Britain's parliamentary system is more efficient at passing legislation than the U.S. separation of, of powers. Um, it, it is less susceptible to gridlock. And of course, there, there are votes of confidence, right? That can be posed by either the opposition or by the government itself trying to assess whether it still enjoys majority support. All right. Okay. So the government um, refers to the chief decision making body of the executive branch. In the UK, this consists of about 100 people, all who must be MPs. Prime ministers have many powers deriving from tradition, as these functions are not codified in Britain's unwritten constitution. As it steers, the government has the right to appoint and dismiss cabinet members, um, the exclusive right to propose bills affecting revenue and expenditures. Let's see. We've also discussed there's a civil service, right? Um, which is another name for this is Whitehall. And so this refers to the UK's bureaucracy or civil service. It's a vital part of the executive branch in formulating and executing government policy. Unlike the president, the prime minister has about a hundred prime positions to fill, and and there are career civil servants um, who occupy the remaining positions. All right. And of course the monarchy, probably the world's most, um, let's say, um, famous uh, monarchy, right, is a living symbol of, of the long continuity of the country's history and the, durability, and the durability of its people and institutions. In spite of the troubles, by the end of the 90s, 70% of British people um, favor with retaining the monarchy. This distinction between the monarch's formal legal powers in Britain's unwritten constitution and her actual decision-making powers is actually rather fuzzy. The monarch is actually part of parliament. No act of parliament can take effect without the, the monarch's royal assent. However, this is, this is obviously just a formality. It's only in 1992 that the Queen agree, agreed to pay some income taxes. Okay, so so when you read, that's it. That's about all we're going to say about the UK. When you think about the UK, think about the Anglo-Saxon tradition, tradition, the privacy of individual rights, right, a la John Locke. Think about evolution and moderation, right, the Magna Carta and the Glorious Revolution and the idea of parliamentary supremacy. Okay, so we're going to go on to, let me erase this, and we'll go on to, uh, to France.